It's happening, people. It's really happening. Cheap supersonic vacuum tube travel. You know, it's like Thunderfoot never even listened to a single bit of correction. But as we see in his latest two videos on the Hyperloop, he's almost completely immune to any consideration that he might have gotten something wrong. So YouTube user Fourth Root, formerly known as Libertarianist, and I teamed up once again to deliver yet another response for him to ignore. To begin with, the Hyperloop is subsonic, and for reasons we went over again and again and again, not a vacuum. It rides on a cushion of air, and it has to deal with the Cantrowitz limit. Here's Thunderfoot arrogantly bleeding about the Hyperloop once again, while, once again, showing he doesn't understand the first thing about it. And at this point, he's been corrected from so many different corners, he really has no excuse. Not quite. So let's take this in reverse order. The Netherlands Hyperloop Test Track. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. 30 meters long. Let's get back to the reason that we're really here. Without much further ado, I give you... The Hyperloop! What is this? A Hyperloop for ants? What? How do you expect people to go really fast if they can't even fit inside the tube? Thunderfoot is just a scale model. I don't want to hear your excuses. It needs to be at least... three times bigger than this. He's absolutely right. Thunderfoot still hasn't gotten the idea the tests start out small and build up from there. But I guess that's what you get when you sit in your ivory tower and pass down your ignorant but supercilious judgment on others instead of actually getting involved in real-world engineering projects to see how they really go. Which was in honor of the uh, Netherlands team who managed to create a Hyperloop pod that couldn't even get to the end of a one kilometer long test track. As we said in our video on the subject, and as numerous people tried to tell Thunderfoot in the comments, it wasn't supposed to. It was supposed to get up to speed and then break. If it did reach the end of the track, that test would have been considered a failure at least as far as the braking system is concerned. Which is funny, since Thunderfoot repeatedly scaremongers that the Hyperloop has no way of stopping in the event of a tube failure and will be just like a bullet being fired from a gun. Thunderfoot keeps relying on Morton's fork and hoping you won't notice. The Hyperloop is incapable of stopping when he needs it to be incapable and stops in an instant when it suddenly becomes convenient for him. Well, Thunderfoot, as we've mentioned in our other videos to you, the solution to these problems that you keep fear-mongering about is a mechanical braking system. You know, like the kind successfully demonstrated in the SpaceX competition and again here by Hyperloop One. It's astounding that a man with a PhD could be so obtuse as to think a successful test is a sign of impracticality. But Hyperloop One, they're the real deal, right? I mean, they just had their Kitty Hawk moment just to demonstrate that the Hyperloop was really possible. Well, in their previous test, the countdown was longer than their actual test. And we covered how Thunderfoot was completely stupid for laughing at this as if it was somehow a point against it. Now, I'm still dubious whether this thing was actually conducted under vacuum, because sound really doesn't travel in the vacuum, so how can you hear stuff? Okay, first of all, not a vacuum deal with it. It was pumped down to the Hyperloop's actual pressure of 100 pascals. I really don't know why Thunderfoot is trying to discredit it, thinking that they didn't actually reduce the pressure when they actually did. I don't know. Now, sure, sound can travel through the metal, but honestly, it doesn't really sound like that. This is yet one more time when Thunderfoot is relying on nothing more than his own personal incredulity. I mean, how would he know what a test pod accelerating down a track at a high speed in a sealed tube in low pressure should sound like? This is from an on-camera microphone mounted to the pod. 
You don't have to be a sound engineer to know that any impact or any other movement to the camera will get on the audio track unless the mic is on a shock mount. This is exactly what it should sound like. I mean, what's he trying to do here anyway? Why is he making this big point about what it should sound like? Is he trying to say they added their own sound or what? This is nothing more than anomaly hunting, precisely like those who claimed that the moon landing was hoaxed. And of course, my doubts are aggravated by the fact that their own promotional video shows that the vacuum access ports are covered with things like pieces of cardboard. Oh, come on, Thunderfoot. Just because something kind of sort of looks like cardboard, you're just going to assume that it is? You really expect me to believe this? You, you expect me to believe that this can fly? It's made out of cardboard. See that? See that piece there? It's cardboard. All we really know is that there are brown square structures covering some of the access ports. My guess is that they're temporary covers to protect the interior from dust or weather. And since this is from a video taken months before the test, they may have only been temporary coverings. But Thunderfoot sees this and immediately jumps to the conclusion that this is a permanent structural feature and that it's made of cardboard, which is why the entire project is laughable. Honestly, Thunderfoot, this is one of the most idiotic things you've said so far, and that is saying something. And he'll have to have those pumps all the way down the 600 kilometer length of the tube. Wow, it took no time at all to break his stupidity record. Does Thunderfoot not understand the basic behavior of gases? Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. All you really need is one pump connected to any point in the tube, and all the air can be pumped out. It's just a question of how long will it take? And yes, the full-scale Hyperloop would benefit from multiple pumping stations to reduce the amount of time it takes to depressurize the tube and to allow each pump to operate with lower power as well as providing redundancy. But so what? Do you have a point here, Thunderfoot? As of yet, none of that has been installed. So their Kitty Hawk moment was basically running a maglev for 500 feet. Seriously. Let's look at what the test really did according to Hyperloop One's blog. According to Hyperloop One, they were testing suspension, lift, guidance, and propulsion. And they were only testing with 100 feet of the motor. The longer the motor, the faster we can go. They're talking about the linear induction motor that propels the Hyperloop down the track, which Thunderfoot still seems keen to ignore. The full-scale motor reached 250 miles per hour, and the pod levitated perfectly. And it braked perfectly as well. Once again, Thunderfoot somehow seems to think that there's something wrong with the ability to stop quickly, while at other times saying that the problem is that the Hyperloop won't be able to stop quickly and will be like a bullet down the barrel of a gun. Make up your mind, Thunderfoot. Hyperloop 1 is deviating from the white paper design by actually using magnetic levitation, which Thunderfoot has been wrongly attributing to the entire Hyperloop project. But even here he gets it wrong. Throughout his videos, he's been acting like a maglev is old technology that's cheap and easy. Not so. As Hyperloop 1 said on their blog, Transrapid, after 35 years of development, was successfully deployed in 2004 in Shanghai. The system uses electromagnets on the pod with an energized computer-controlled track providing levitation control and propulsion. TransRapid's choice of an active-powered track created a good deal of cost and complexity, something we are trying to minimize. SE Maglev uses passive levitation, where only the propulsive parts of the track are powered, and holds the record for the fastest train ever tested at more than 600 kilometers per hour. That's 370 miles per hour, about half the speed of the Hyperloop. Its pod magnets are superconducting, but that mandates suboptimal magnetic field geometry and colossal expense. While non-superconducting permanent magnets are much stronger now and easier to work with than they were in the 1970s, we are taking a different approach from theirs that we believe can achieve similar performance at a much lower cost. What they are using is a new design with permanent magnets on the pod with a passive track. The only energy coming from the speed of the pod itself, as they explain. 
When magnets and conductors play together, electrons in the conductor move around to try to cancel out any change of flux. The trick with the Hyperloop 1 levitation system is to control the conductivity so that electricity flows more easily in some directions than in others. This way, the harmful eddy currents are reduced, while bulk flows trace out shapes impossible in bulk conductors, repelling the pod magnets with very low drag. This is a highly innovative system that can be done cheaply, using less power, and operate at higher speeds than traditional passive or active maglev technology. Once again, Thunderfoot just doesn't know what he's talking about. Forgive me if I'm not terribly impressed by that. Sorry, Thunderfoot, we can't forgive you because we and numerous other people have tried to explain to you how engineering tests operate. You seem to want it to be like an exciting movie where it takes a long time with intense drama and maybe even some music. You see a short, blasé test and not much to be impressed by because you have zero understanding of the engineering behind what's going on. And that ignorance is now willful. You haven't been in any way open to being corrected or educated on this matter. Okay, there's still a lot to cover, both in the remainder of this video and in an additional video he uploaded shortly after this one, so we'll get to all of that next time. Until then, stay strong and be free.